Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dwight Hughes. He's an historian, an author, and a public speaker uh, focusing on the topics of Civil War naval history. He comes by this interest naturally as a graduate of of the Naval Academy and 20 years in service in the Navy, beginning with Vietnam. So we appreciate your service. Thank you. Currently, he is a contributing author at Emerging Civil War. His new book is the topic of his presentation tonight, and he will be available at the end of the question and answer period to sign some books down front here. That's just a little unpaid advertising there. His topic is unlike anything that ever floated, the Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. Ladies and gentlemen, Dwight Hughes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be here today. What a, what a great group. Um, I have to uh, <clears throat> apologize, my voice is fading a little bit, so I'm going to speak slowly and enunciate as best I can. If you got problems, just wave at me, I'll slow down and, and do the best I can. So everybody hearing me okay now? Okay. All right. My uh, tablet doesn't show the slides either. What do I do? Right. Okay. Um, all right. Probably on here someplace. Yeah, but it's too good. We've got slips off my slide. Sorry, folks. Technical te technical difficulties here. Yeah, right on the screen. <laughs> well, I can, I can just signal the. It was on there before. There we go. Okay, all set. All right. Um, talking today about the uh, USS Monitor and the Battle of Hampton Roads. Um, whoop, that went the wrong way. That's it. You enjoying this slide in front of you? <laughs> Lots of great slides. There must be a way to get to the start here that's faster than this. For them. Okay. All right. Let's try again. There we go. All right. Good. Saturday, March 8th, 1862. The USS Monitor steams into Chesapeake Bay after rushing down from New York through gale force winds, almost sinking in the process. Monitor's mission, to defeat the Confederate ironclad ram, the CSS Virginia, 
before she destroys the wooden warships of the Union fleet in Hampton Roads. Monitor was a steam-propelled, iron-plated raft with a cylindrical iron turret and two 11-inch guns. The flat, expansive deck was barely a foot and a half above the surface. 14 officers and 57 crewmen were encased below the, below the waterline. Okay. 14 officers and 57 crewmen were encased below the waterline. The captain ordered an exhausted and dispirited crew to strip the vessel of her sea rig and make all preparations for battle. To mid 19th century mariners, this enclosed, cramped artificial space, which resembled future submarines, was a radical departure from sailing and fighting on the open decks and in the high rigging of a traditional man of war, and not a little intimidating. Monitor redefined the relationship between men and machines in war. She challenges it ancient concepts of honor and valor. These developments paralleled the transformative combat experience of soldiers who began the conflict standing up in open fields, manfully confronting the enemy face to face, but ended up burrowing into trenches and crouching behind elaborate fortifications. Technology had advanced the defense over the offense. Paymaster William Keeler wrote to his wife, you may rest assured your better half will be in no more danger from rebel compliments than if he was seated by your side at home. There isn't danger enough to give us any glory. Not a man is exposed in action. Our boilers and our entire machinery are completely and effectually protected. Monitor would become a cultural icon of American industrial strength and ingenuity in advertisements for everything from whiskey to refrigerators. She embodied social and in, she embodied social and institutional as well as industrial revolutions. But this would be a symbolic role which would outshine her accomplishments beyond a single engagement in a specific set of circumstances. After the battle, the Union caught monitor fever. 50 monitors would be built in a bewildering range of one, two, and three turret classes. But as a warship type, they were of limited utility. With a low profile, monitors were not seagoing vessels and were not effective against shore fortifications, although they did neutralize several Confederate ironclads. The most important technical innovation was the rotating armored turret, which would evolve into 20th century battleships. But during Monitor's construction, public opinion had been decidedly ambivalent concerning this strange watercraft the technological transition in one generation from timeless horse-drawn transportation to huge puffing locomotives had been breathtaking. On the water, tall warships always inspired awe, but so far they look much the same, even when driven by steam as well as sail. It was not clear where mo little monitor fit in this revolution. Was she even a ship or just a small ironclad two-gun battery? Many could not conceive that a slab of iron would float. One Vermont reporter could hardly find words to describe the thing. She is, in fact, unlike anything that ever floated on Neptune's bosom. Viewed from a distance, 
monitor looked insignificant and harmless, he wrote, but standing upon its deck, she appeared powerful and invulnerable. This sea monster resembled the Leviathan of the scriptures. Okay. The vessel had a most singular appearance, wrote one officer. From a half mile distant, she appeared to be sinking. The hull was not visible while the turret sat upon the water by itself. People said she looked like a wash tub on a raft, a cheese box on a plank, a hat on a shingle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nathaniel Hawthorne would write. It looked like a gigantic rat trap. It was ugly, questionable, suspicious, evidently mischievous. Nay, I will allow myself to call it devilish. Monitor's captain, John L. Warden, recalled, here was an unknown, untried vessel with all but a small portion below the waterline. Her crew to live with the ocean beating over their heads an iron coffin-like ship of which the gloomiest predictions were made, with her crew shut out from sunlight and the air above the sea, depending entirely on artificial means to supply the air they breathed. A failure of the machinery would be almost certain death to her men. Monitor proceeded across Chesapeake Bay as evening descended. They heard heavy guns in the distance. Plumes of smoke hung over the land. Little black spots sprang into the air, paused for a moment, and expanded into large white clouds. Gun flashes lit the darkening horizon. Bursting shells flashed in the air. The pilot boarded and informed them that the dreaded Virginia was raking havoc in Hampton Roads. The USS Cumberland was sunk. The USS Congress was ablaze. Vessels were fleeing like a covey of frightened quails. Their lights danced over the water in all directions. The steam frigate USS Minnesota the most powerful ship the Navy could deploy, had run hard aground off Newport News earlier in the day while pursuing the marauding Virginia. The rebel monster surely would return in the morning to destroy Minnesota. Warden was ordered to take Monitor to defend her. An atmosphere of gloom pervaded the fleet, recalled Lieutenant Green. The pygmy aspect of the newcomer did not inspire confidence among those who had witnessed the destruction of the day before. Congress blazed like a gigantic torch stuck in the mud where she had been pulverized by Virginia. Around 2 a.m., she blew up. Certainly a grander sight was never seen, wrote Lieutenant Green, but it went straight to the marrow of our bones. Near us, too, at the bottom of the river, lay the Cumberland with her silent crew of brave men who died while fighting their guns to the water's edge. The USS Monitor entered Hampton Roads, cleared for action, and anchored near Minnesota. Her journey to this point has been as unprecedented as the impending battle. Let us step back and look at her origins. A furious ironclad arms race was on in Europe. New developments in naval armaments, larger guns, explosive shells, rifled bores, had rendered wooden warships increasingly vulnerable. 
significant improvements have been made in iron armor as demonstrated in the recent Crimean War. The French launched the first ironclad battleship, the Goa, in November 1859. In 1860, the British produced the magnificent HMS Warrior, the first warship with a holy iron hull and the most advanced, most powerful in the world. The U.S. Navy had been in the forefront of developments in steam propulsion and naval armaments. In the 1840s and 50s, they ceased building sail-only warships while developing advanced wooden steam cruisers culminating in the Merrimack frigate class. These powerful warships were equal or superior to conventional European frigates. But Americans had no far-flung empire to defend and no neighboring threats. Naval strategy focused on harbor and coastal defense with swift cruisers like Merrimack to protect commerce in distant waters. They let the Europeans pursue costly experiments in the unproven technology of iron armor. Then secession altered the strategic picture dramatically. In Europe, the war disrupted industry, trade, and finance, caused high unemployment and social and political unrest. Great Britain seriously considered intervening on behalf of the Confederacy, perhaps by force. British support for rebel commerce raiders and blockade running enraged the United States. Arguments over the responsibilities of neutral countries in wartime harken back to 1812 and the revolution. The specter of a third war with Great Britain, the world's most powerful nation, now armed with ironclads, became real and immediate. Gideon Wells, in the summer of 1861, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells struggled with the notion of ironclad vessels. It was a subject full of difficulty and doubt, he told Congress. England and France had built large, powerful, seagoing ironclads. The United States had none. It was evident that a new and material element in maritime warfare was developing itself and demanded immediate attention. Senate, Iowa Senator James Grimes supported the development of ironclads. We need a more effective blockade, he said on the floor of the Senate. Scoundrels north as well as scoundrels south are carrying on an unlawful trade in fraud of our revenue. Pirates and sea rovers must be captured. Southern harbors and forts must be retaken. Commerce must be protected and Northern harbors defended. Suppose England in her love for cotton should attempt to break our blockade and we should get into trouble with her. What is to become of our northern cities and our cities upon the coast? Secretary Wells was overseeing an immense, unprecedented warship procurement and building program while instigating a nearly impossible continent-wide blockade. Without further study, he concluded, it would not be advisable to commit heavy expenditures by way of experiment on unproven technology. The most immediate threats were Confederate ironclads under construction in Norfolk, Mobile, and New Orleans, particularly the former USS Merrimack to become the CSS Virginia. The Mobile Register boasted that this new weapon would be a floating fortress 
that would be able to defeat the whole Navy of the United States and bombard its cities. With their great size, strength, powerful engines, and invulnerable iron casing, she would easily destroy or disperse the blockading fleet. She could throw bombs into Fort Monroe. We hope soon to hear that she is ready to commence her avenging career on the seas. Northern public opinion was aroused also. The Philadelphia Examiner thought it curious that the United States should be so behind the age. If we intend to have a national naval force worthy of our power and pretensions, we shall have to build iron cased vessels as France and England have done and are doing. Congress, Congress directed Secretary Wells to investigate plans and procedures for constructing iron or steel clad steamships or steam batteries, appropriating, appropriating for that purpose one and a half million dollars. Wells approved three designs to confront the potential European threat. The first two were conventional wooden hulls with iron cladding, broadside battery, auxiliary steam engines, and sailing rig. They would become the USS New Ironsides and the USS Galena. The final selection was proposed by Swedish engineer John Ericsson. The intense stocky Ericsson, born in 1803, had a long career in Sweden, England, and America, designing, building, and improving steam engines. He produced a host of inventions, including the shipboard steam condenser, and he collected numerous patents. Ericsson's proposal for monitor possessed, recalled Secretary Wells, extraordinary and valuable features for coast and river blockade. It involved a revolution in naval warfare. President Lincoln remarked, all I have to say is what the girl said when she put her foot into the stocking. It strikes me there's something in it. Ericsson's low profile concept was inspired by Swedish lumber rafts. He never claimed to have invented the revolving armored turret. The idea had been circulating among engineers for decades, but he was the first to successfully deploy it. The ironclad board had serious reservations, but reluctantly agreed to proceed. The plan addressed the critical requirement, a combat ready craft suitable for restricted waters to be rapidly constructed and deployed. In its favor were presumed invulnerability, small size, shallow draft, and limited exposed target area. Worrisome unknowns included over-reliance on steam power, had no sails, semi-submerged hull, questionable stability, and untried turret-mounted armament. Monitor also was unseaworthy in an uncomfortable and cramped environment to operate guns and steam machinery. The contract was signed on October 4th, 1861, for an ironclad shot proof steam battery. John Erickson and his backers were to deliver the vessel complete and ready for service within the unprecedented span of 100 days for a price of $275,000. Erickson began, began a frantic and incredibly complex manufacturing process using civilian facilities because Navy shipyards could not produce ironclads. 
he orchestrated a conglomerate of nine contractors and multiple subcontractors working simultaneously in at least seven Northeast cities to produce raw material, angle iron, bar iron, plate iron, and rivets, and finished components for assembly of Continental Iron Works in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Most of these firms cluster around New York City and Albany, centers of steam engine and iron manufacturing. They applied methods and materials in common use for locomotives and other land products. Only Yankees could produce an experimental ironclad vessel from scratch in 100 days. Despite the rush, Erickson did not scrimp on furnishings and gadgets. The officers' closet-sized staterooms were appointed in Victorian opulence, while crewmen slept in hammocks on the more utilitarian berth deck. Six-inch round glass windows, or deck lights, set in the deck overhead, supplemented by oil lamps, provided meager illumination. Erickson crafted a compact 400 horsepower steam engine with a single cylinder, 40 inches in diameter, driving two horizontal pistons. Auxiliary steam engines, an uncommon feature at the time, drove the turret revolution and the ventilation, ventilation blowers providing fresh air. A steam condenser provided fresh water. The guns were mounted in a customized low profile friction carriages to dampen recoil in the confined turret. Erickson installed the first custom designed pressure flushing below the waterline water closets or heads. The ship's surgeon operated the flushing valves in the wrong order and suffered the indignity of being blown off the seat by a jet of water. Gideon Wells selected 27-year veteran Lieutenant John L. Warden to command monitor. Warden had been captured by Confederates the previous year while running secret dispatches to Fort Pickens in Florida, becoming the conflict's first prisoner of war. Confined in Alabama for eight months before being exchanged, Warden was still ill and weak when he assumed command. Lieutenant Samuel Dana Green was named executive officer second in command. The 22-year-old Marylander graduated from the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis in June, 1859. Green represented the Young Professional Officer Corps, educated at the new school, steeped in the new technologies, and fired in the crucible of war to lead the Navy into the 20th century. On a drizzly morning of January 30th, 1862, Monitors slid down the ways into the East River before a large, spontaneous crowd. The New York Tribune wrote, The assemblage cheered rapturously as the strange-looking craft glided swiftly and gracefully into its new element. Nearby vessels fired salutes. Predictions that she would break her back or swamp upon launching were disproven. But the CSS Virginia was expected to appear in Hampton Roads any day. So work continued around the clock to complete fitting out. Despite futile attempts at secrecy, journalists swarmed the ship, leaving in their reporting little to the imagination for friend or foe. Captain Warden sought volunteers from warships in New York Harbor. 
he described to them the probable perils of passage and the certainty of combat. Many more enthusiastically responded than were required. A better crew, no naval commander ever had the honor to command, Warden would later write. But few of these men had pre-war sea service. Most were recent recruits with little or no maritime experience. Some were European immigrants, and at least two were African-American. These volunteers endured ribbing from fellow seamen. In a solemn and prophetic tone, one old salt proclaimed, you fellows certainly have got a lot of nerve or want to commit suicide, one or the other. Several volunteers took one look at Monitor and promptly deserted. After hurried and superficial testing, Monitor got underway for Hampton Roads on March 6, 1862. On that morning of Saturday, March 8th, as Monitor approached the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, a frustrated commander-in-chief convened a council of war to prod Major General George B. McClellan into action on his proposed campaign to capture Richmond. He planned to land at Urbana on the Rappahannock, but as General Joe Johnston fell back from Manassas, McClellan decided instead to invade the peninsula at Fort Monroe. Throughout that afternoon, as discussions continued, telegrams filtered in as the former USS Merrimack, now CSS Virginia, sallied forth into Hampton Roads. The Merrimack is close at hand, said one. Then the Merrimack is engaging the Cumberland at close quarters. Later on, the Congress is now burning. Presidential Secretary John Hay concluded, for a while, the news looked very badly. Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton ordered the news be made public at once to alert northern ports that they were in danger. The next morning, Sunday, March 9th, wrote a senior Treasury official, was as gloomy as any that Washington had experienced since the beginning of the war. The president called an emergency session at the White House for a much alarmed cabinet. Secretary John Hay reported that panic was intense at Willard's Hotel. Nothing was too wild to be believed. Presidential Secretaries John Hay and John Nicolay characterized this cabinet meeting as perhaps the most excited and impressive of the whole war. Gideon Wells was asked what could be done to counter this formidable monster. The Navy Secretary had no answers beyond faith in the untried monitor. She should have arrived in Hampton Roads the day before, but due to a break in the telegraph cable, they had no news of her. According to Secretary Wells, Secretary of War Stanton insisted the rebel ironclad would change the whole character of the war. She would destroy every naval vessel and take Fort Monroe. McClellan's campaign against Richmond must be abandoned. General Burnside's forces must be recalled from the North Carolina Sounds. The vital blockading base of Port Royal Sound must be given up. Virginia would come up the Potomac, disperse Congress, destroy the Capitol. She might go to New York and Boston and destroy those cities or hold them for ransom. The Army Secretary was contemptuous of the notion that a two-gun iron raft could stop her. But Wells assured them that Virginia was so loaded down with armor, 
She could not venture outside Hampton Roads. She could not ascend the river and surprise us with a cannonball. Certainly, she could not attack simultaneously every city and harbor on the coast. Secretary of War Stan telegraphed governors and major cities of the North to man their forts and place timber rafts and other obstructions at the mouths of the harbors. Preparations were made to block the Potomac. Finally, that Sunday afternoon, the chattering telegraph produced the lost message from the night before. Monitor had arrived and will take care of Virginia. The president and his cabinet awaited the outcome. In Hampton Roads that morning, the USS Minnesota was still hard aground, the crew making hasty preparations to abandon ship with monitor anchored nearby. Fog lifting from the water about 8 a.m. revealed the CSS Virginia approaching. Minnesota's captain declared to monitor's Captain Warden, if I cannot lighten my ship off the shoals, I shall destroy her. Warden assured him, I will stand by you to the last if I can help you. No, sir, you cannot help me, was the reply. Within the dim, claustrophobic metal drum of Monitor's turret, 20 feet in diameter, behind eight inches of iron, squatted the two immense 11 inch Dahlgren smoothbores. Lieutenant Green supervised 16 brawny sailors, packed in eight to a gun. None of them had been drilled on these guns or in this turret. Captain Warden took station on the pilot house platform near the bow, his head and shoulders in the iron box, peering through the half inch viewing slit. Jammed at his elbow was the pilot and the helmsman. The only communication between the pilot house and the turret was via runners on the deck below. Below the turret, recalled Paymaster Keeler, everyone was at his post, fixed like a statue. The most profound silence reigned. We were enclosed in what we supposed to be an impenetrable armor. We knew that a powerful foe was about to meet us. Ours was an untried experiment and our enemy's first fire might make it a coffin for us all. The suspense was awful as we waited in the dim light, expecting every moment to hear the crash of our enemy's shot. Warden charged directly for Virginia, placing a little monitor between Minnesota and the foe. In the gloom below, Keeler heard the muffled whomp of a gun, then another and another. Virginia and Minnesota blasted away at each other at long range, skipping shells along the water surface. Rounds could take 20 to 40 skips. Several friendly shots bounced off monitor. Wrote Keeler, the infernal howl of the shells as they flew over our vessel was all that broke the silence and made it seem still more terrible. Captain Warden closed to about a third of a mile, altered course, and ordered commence firing. The mammoth gun port cover rumbled open. The big black muzzle protruded. Lieutenant Green sighted along the top of the barrel and yanked the firelock at about 8.45 a.m. The entire structure throbbed and trembled with a deafening concussion as the eight-ton behemoth leapt inward. The rebel ironclad turned her head upstream and replied with a broadside. 
followed by a volume of musketry, which rattled on our iron deck like hailstones, but caused no damage. These first shots, however, made quite a sensation on worried gunners inside the turret. Warden expected that most rebel shots against the curved exterior of the turret would glance off without damage, but he worried that a shot fired directly in line with the vertical axis of the turret could deform the structure and jam the revolving mechanisms. The captain also feared that hundreds of bolt and rivet heads holding together eight layers of one inch iron plate would blast off when hit outside creating lethal projections inside the turret. In either case, monitor would be helpless. But, he reported, a 150 pound projectile hitting straight on from 30 yards just created a smooth dent, a perfect mold of the shell, two and a half inches deep. The indentation carried right through eight inches of plate without cracking or splitting the iron. To everyone's relief, enemy fire did not dislodge a single rivet head and the turret continued to revolve. One rebel shell struck the vulnerable deck edge and tore up one of the plates. Worried that the blow might open a seam below the waterline, Warden crawled out of the gun port, walked to the side, and lay down upon his chest to examine the damage, with bullets zinging off the iron deck as thick as hailstones in a storm. The hull was uninjured, except for a few splinters of wood, so he crawled back into the turret. Warden announced to the crew that Virginia could not sink them if we let her pound us for a month, the men cheered. Guns bellowed through choking white smoke, shot with flame, round scream, clang, boomed and splashed all around. Engines thumped and clanked, blowers roared, black clouds billowed from stacks as the big propellers thrashed the water. Men trapped inside, many stripped to the waist with scraps of cloth around their ears, shouted, sweated, and struggled to manage their metal monsters. Virginia's captain, Lieutenant Catesby Jones, reported, we were often within a ship's length of monitor. Once, while passing, we fired a broadside at her at only a few yards distant. She and her turret were appeared to be under perfect control. Her light draft enabled her to move about us at pleasure. Ironclad against ironclad, recalled Monitor's chief engineer. We maneuvered about the bay here and went at each other with mutual fierceness. They circled awkwardly in what would appear to a modern observer as slow motion. Five times during the engagement, we touched each other, wrote Lieutenant Green. The shot, shell, grape, canister, musket, and rifle balls flew about us in every direction, but did no damage. Our turret was struck several times, and though the noise was pretty loud, it did not affect us any. Inside the turret, Two men leaned against the bulkhead, just as a rebel shot whanged against the outside, knocking them senseless, knocked one clean over the gun. But both recovered by the following morning, the only injuries among the crew. The effect of one shut up in a revolving drum is perplexing, wrote Lieutenant Green. Both vessels were continuously turning, 
backing and forwarding, while the turret spun independently. This was not your traditional man of war broadside gun deck. Green could see out only through the few inch gap between the gun muzzle and the top of the gun port, a favorite target for eager muskets on Virginia. Through smoke, noise, concussion, and the whirling of the turret, the lieutenant was disoriented and frequently blind. He could not see the enemy. A rebel projectile entering an open gun port would put them out of action. He could not even see how his own guns were pointed relative to his own vessel. A careless round fired forward and striking the pilot house directly in front of the turret would end the fight. To make matters worse, the steam-driven turret was slow to start revolving and once moving, slow to stop, even slower to reverse. Like all monitors machinery, these mechanisms were undergoing their first combat trial. Green found it nearly impossible to stop rotation in line of fire, open the gun port, sight and shoot at a target that was itself moving. So he settled on a pattern, rotate the turret away from Virginia and stop to load, leaving gun ports open to save time and effort. Then when ready, start revolving again and fire both guns on the fly as the target swept past the muzzles. Green personally aimed and fired every round. To Lieutenant John Taylor Wood aboard Virginia, Monitor appeared but a pygmy, but in her size was one element of her success. The monitor was firing every seven or eight minutes, and nearly every shot struck. A Confederate Marine recalled, when Monitor's turret revolved, we could see nothing but two immense guns. Those guns bellowed and promptly disappeared, while his gun crew struggled to respond. Lieutenant Jones wondered how the Yankees could take aim so quickly. The Virginia, however, was a large target, he wrote, and generally so near that Monitor's shot did not often miss. It did not appear to us that our shell had any effect upon the Monitor. Jones maneuvered his lumbering vessel for nearly an hour, trying to ram and board Monitor. But Warden turned the vessel away and suffered only a glancing blow. In the process, Monitor just missed Virginia's submerged stern, almost snapping off her rudder and propeller. As, as Monitor slid by, Virginia delivered a 68 pound rifle shell against the pilot house from about 20 yards. Captain Warden's eyes were close behind the viewing slip. The explosion cracked and almost broke the iron box, flooding it with light. Paymaster Keeler stood below the platform awaiting orders. A flash of light and a cloud of smoke filled the house, he wrote. I noticed the captain stagger and put his hands to his eyes. The blood was running from his face, which was blackened with powder smoke. The pilot and the helmsman were shaken but not injured, while a stunned and partially blinded warden ordered the helm to starboard, turning monitor away from the action and into shallow water where Virginia could not follow and her guns could not reach. My eyes, Warden said, I am blind, but do not mind me. Save the Minnesota if you can. Lieutenant Green came forward from the turret to assume command. 
seeing Monitor withdraw, Minnesota's captain ordered every preparation to destroy his ship. But the rebel ironclad did not approach. Evening was descending. The tide was ebbing. Virginia was slightly damaged and low on ammunition. Lieutenant Jones decided to retire, assuming he could resume the contest the next day. Confederates would excoriate Jones for leaving Minnesota in enemy hands. Now in command of Monitor, Lieutenant Green longed to re-engage, but Virginia was retiring. He had to cover Minnesota. Another hit on the pilot house could be disabling, and their wounded captain needed attention. So Monitor let go a few last shots and turned away. Green also would be criticized for this decision by armchair admirals. Paymaster Keeler climbed through the iron hatch to a deck strewn with shell fragments. Virginia's parting shot shrieked over their heads and exploded about 100 feet away. Small steamers and boats from Newport News, Fort Monroe, and the various men of war surrounded them all eager to learn the extent of our injuries and congratulate us on our victory. Thousands of spectators were astonished to learn that Monitor was uninjured and ready to resume the fight. Aboard Minnesota, Assistant Secretary of the Navy Gustavus Fox had seen the whole fight. He hailed down to Monitor that they had fought the greatest naval battle on record and behaved as gallantly as men could. Wrote Lieutenant Green to his parents, I felt proud and happy then, mother, and felt fully repaid for all that I had suffered. When told that Minnesota was saved, Warden said that I can die happy. But future Admiral John Warden would recover most of the sight in his right eye, but his face was permanently blackened and his left eye destroyed. Monitor was struck 22 times, twice in the pilot house, nine on the turret, eight in the side armor, and three on deck. Lieutenant Green was black with smoke and powder down to his underclothes. His nervous system was shot. Every bone ached. He could hardly stand. My nerves and muscles twitched as though electric shocks were continually passing through them, and my head ached as if it would burst. Sometimes I thought my brain would come out right over my eyebrows. I lay down and tried to sleep. I might as well have tried to fly. Thank you. So happy, happy to answer any questions. No, not not that I know of. Uh, it, it was a small navy, so the chances are they knew of each other. 
but I, I didn't find any indication that they personally knew each other. Okay, yes, that's a good question. Um, there essentially was a standoff uh, for the next couple months in Hampton Roads. Uh, as the Virginia repeatedly kept out, came out and, and tried to re-engage Monitor. But uh, Secretary Wells uh, told Monitor's captain not to re-engage Virginia. Uh, he was afraid that uh, any serious damage to Monitor would put her out of action completely, and, and then all the wooden vessels in Hampton Roads would be easy picking. Uh, so Monitor stood by um, uh, in a defensive posture uh, she would have stopped or gone after Virginia if she had gone after any of the other vessels. Uh, but there was was as many combat. And then finally in May, uh, Union forces um, recaptured Norfolk and the Gosport shipyard, and the Virginia had nowhere to go. Uh, she was too deep to get up the James, and she really wasn't reliable enough to try to sail out the Chesapeake uh, and get to sea. And so the Virginians blew her up uh, right there in Hampton Roads, uh, which was the which was the end of the Virginia. Uh, the Monitor hung around for the rest of the summer. Uh, she participated on May in the middle of May at the Battle of Drury's Bluff, uh, where she and the USS Galena, one of the other Union ironclads, uh, tried to uh, um, conquer the uh, the batteries on Drury's Bluff up the James uh, within about eight miles of Richmond. And they were unable to do so because the batteries were so high, the plunging shot uh, went through the thin armor of the Galena and really, really damaged her. And Monitor alone couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't do the job. Um, and the, the Navy officer in charge, Commander Rogers, always maintained that if the army had gone ashore, gotten around Fort, uh, uh, the Fort Darling there on, on Drury's Bluff, they could have gotten all the way to Richmond. But that was right in the middle of McClellan's Peninsula campaign and, and he was busy retreating. So uh, it didn't happen. Um, then finally, late in that year, late in 1862, Monitor was ordered down south uh, to participate in action down there. And as they were towing her down the coast uh, around Cape Hatteras, uh, she ran into a gale and was sunk. And so that was the end of the monitor. Um, she has, as you probably know, has subsequently parts of her been raised and are at the terrific museum uh, at Newport News at the Monitor Center, where you can actually go see the turret in its bath of preservative, as well as a fully reconstructed mock-up of her along with a whole other bits of her. Um, How fast did they rotate the turret? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, I think, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. <laughs> I, I think it go, I, I think they could, they could get a few revolutions in, in, a, in a couple minutes, uh, but it, but it was pretty slow. It, it wasn't, it wasn't rapid. Uh, Um, it, they, they lost uh, a number of crewmen, uh, I think um, about 18, 11 or 18 crewmen went down with the monitor. The others were, were rescued just barely by the ship that was there escorting them. Um, and when they brought up the monitor turret, 
uh, the turret had flipped over on its uh, on its top, so it was upside down. Uh, once they cleared all the sediment out of the turret, they found the remains of three of the crewmen. Uh, they were subsequently recovered, and actually, I think they identified them, and they they were they were later buried with honors. <laughs>